Sarah, I want to talk to you about something that I've been using that I've been really appreciating and enjoying with this, you know, kids, book, uh, business, life situation that I have going on. As you and I both know, we have to just squish. It runs in anywhere, everywhere, but we also want to get the most out of it. You and I both are very driven people. We want to get mm-hmm. our runs to the best of their ability. And for me, a lot of my runs end up being when I wake up first thing in the morning, I go straight out the door. And I... Have you ever had tried black currant, the flavor? I love it. Oh my God, I me too. Yeah. Black currant mm-hmm. is something in England for, for listeners. Um, black currant is a berry, but it's like slightly tangy, slightly sweet. Um, is that how you would describe it? I, I, yeah, it's kind of like pomegranate-esque. It's really delicious. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah, so um, I came across this product called Two Before, which is black currant flavored. It's gonna, mm. It increases your endurance. It helps you with inflammation, supports your immunity. But most importantly, it's comes in like a, it comes in a caffeine and a non-caffeine version. So I can like get this energy boost before my runs in the morning, or especially, I'm I'm sure you've had many of these, these afternoon squishings when you're already kind of Mm -hmm. a bit cooked, but you know, you have to get a run in and I've really been loving it. And I love, 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 love that it is black currant flavor because that just makes it so easy to drink. It's enjoyable. And, um, I know it's like helping me, even though it's a pre-workout. So I want to um, have you try it out because I think you're going to love it too, especially if yep, you love please. that taste of black currant. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to tell listeners, if you go to two before the number two, two before.com and use code mm-hmm. Tina, you can get yourself 30% off. I definitely encourage you to check it out. If you are stretched for time, squeezing your runs in, busy person who still wants to get the most out of your training, this is such a great product to have. So yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for listening, Sarah. Because I I think you're gonna love it. I'm literally looking up on my phone right now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> love it. All right, welcome back to our for real episode. Tina, are you ready for today's question? Ooh, yes, let's go ahead. I prefaced it by telling Tina that mm. this was deep and heavy, but actually, it's really not that deep. Okay. Okay. Um, it's just more serious, like because it's hard. Sometimes we don't see these things until we look back in retrospect. So I want to know what was the biggest turning point in your life, and you may not have realized it at the time, but can you can you hit like a defining moment? You're like like you're like wow, that was a turning point that led to who I am today. And I know there's probably Mm. several, I'm sure you can think of dozens, but what is the most significant? And you can share more than one if you want to. That's Mm. totally okay. Um, I would say, yeah, there's definitely been a few, but what comes to mind is the moment I, my visa was denied in California, uh, de- denied to go to California before I came to the US, like to go to Michigan, to Ferris State. Because I think before that moment, I had been planning on going to California. I was going to um, follow this path, although it wasn't really defined. Now I look back on it, I ca- it was never going to work. But I had this, like, I was going to live in California. I was going to, you know, go to school there. And then who knows what that would have happened, Who would what would have happened there. But getting that visa denied felt like one of the worst moments of my life. And it probably, it, it like, in terms of um, anguish that I felt, it really was because it was like, what do I do now? Like, I didn't have a university plan in the UK. I didn't have a backup. I didn't have anything like everything was riding on that. And then when it didn't happen, I literally couldn't see where I was going to go from there. Um, but going to then, you know, that moment led to me giving this opportunity in Michigan a chance. And then as, um, you know, I ended up meeting my husband Mm -hmm. on the first day I arrived in, in Michigan. So like that was definitely, I would say the, the turning point in terms of the direction it set me in. And it also, you know, it led to me meeting you. It led to my running career, having, uh, the getting back to actually being a focus for me, because even that year in California and that time I was going to spend in California, I wasn't really committed. I wasn't taking it seriously. I was just kind of coasting. So yeah, I'd say that was the the real moment that comes to mind for me. You know, it's crazy. Like someday 
when they are, you know, 17, 18, 19 years old, Bailey or Chloe may come to you in tears. Like, what do I do? Like this mm. huge thing just fell oh, yeah. beneath my feet. And you can tell them that story because mm. so many times in life, what we think is like the end of the world disaster thing that happened. We look back and we're like, I would never change that in a million years because mm. it led to where you are today. And sure, if, if your visa hadn't been denied, you've gone there, you would have, you know, a completely different life. And I'm sure yep. you'd be happy in that life. Yep. But right now with the family you have, with the husband you have, with the career that you've had, you, you wouldn't change it. Yeah. Right. No, 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 absolutely not. And it's so interesting because I also think about my mom, who was the person who, you know, met me after I found out that decision she was in London with me and having to like not only see your daughter in that state but then not be able to offer any my mom is a fix-it person so especially with her but like not you like she couldn't say well maybe we'll do this like there was no path forward in any direction from what we could see um, and so that I think about that with her and how hard that had to have been that she couldn't say, yeah, we'll, we'll, well, maybe we'll do this instead because there was no yeah. offer to give. So, yeah. What about you? Yeah, that's crazy. Um, I had, I had to give this one some thought while you were talking. I was just like, cause I don't, I don't think I have anything that's, that was that, um, pivotal in that it, it was like, it was okay. There was sink or swim. Like you had no way out, mm. but for me, after I think I was 25, I was 25 and I just run my first, um, Boston marathon. Now leading into that race, um, I had been planning to do the Olympic trials that year, but I was injured. So I skipped the trials and I ran Boston instead. And because there were so few Americans, um, I ended Wait, up, you being... were 20, this was the Neely race. Yes. You were 25, 25. Yeah. <laughs> So, that seems like a, you I know have been I was 20. such a baby, but I was, I was 25. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Go um, on, keep going. And so, uh, so I ran that race and I was, uh, I think I missed the top 10 by like five seconds or something like yeah. that. And I was second American, but because I had skipped the trials, I'd been training since like November. I have never been so burnt out in my life. And when that race was over, um, I went to Pete, my coach at the time. And I was like, I need to stop. I don't know for how long but I need to not run. And he, he, you know, credit to him. He gave me this permission. He said, listen, don't run until you miss it. And then once you miss it, take another week and then we'll talk. So for this time, it ended up being um, almost a month, like three and a half yeah, weeks off. That. Yeah. So I didn't want to think about running. I did, certainly didn't want to go out and run. So I was living in Kentucky. I was living with you, Tina. In Kentucky. Mm. Well, no, I wasn't with you. I was in a different mm -hmm. town, but yeah. I was living in Kentucky and this was the time that I thought, okay, what am I going to do at this time? I didn't have kids. I had all day, every day. I didn't know when I was going to run again. So I thought, what if I try to write a book? Um, because I'd heard that stat of like, of the people who try to write a book, like who start 97% of those people don't finish their book. And so I thought, I just want to see if I can. Um, and so over the course of 10 days, I wrote 60,000 words. Now mm -hmm. for those, for people who are a writer, like that's a lot, that's a lot of work. That is dawn till dusk writing every single day for 10 days in a row. And a novel officially becomes a novel at 50,000 words. So technically I wrote a novel. Um, it was not publishable. It was not good. But in that moment, I proved to myself, okay, I can do it. I can do this thing. I can do it and finish it. Um, and I did try very briefly. I tried to take that book out like to agents and publishers yeah, yeah. and I had literally zero interest in it. Um, but that sparked something in me that eight years later um, resulted in me signing a contract yes. with Simon & Schuster for three times the amount that I paid for that house that I was yes. living in, yes. in Kentucky. So even though I was still running professionally, running still had my heart. That was the turning point where I realized when running is gone, because God willing, I'm going to long outlive my best years athletically. When running is gone, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to, I'm going to have this um, writing to, to fall That's back on. So yeah, that was... That is definitely yep. a, that moment, I would say, a turning point for sure. I remember you showing me when you were in that period, like the 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 office you had made for yourself and you had made <laughs> the like wardrobe into a little nook. Reading nook, yeah. Yeah, and, um, <laughs> and you had this desk and you were so proud to like show me the desk and it was like a wooden, yeah. kind of very like intricate, well it's made. the desk I'm sitting at right oh, now. Oh, you are still amazing. Yep. Um, and I remember you would, yeah, you were just like talking about writing and yeah, I remember you showing me that. Um, yeah. so that's, that's amazing that that was like, yeah, I didn't put that together, but that's so true. Uh, yeah. and you know, not having the running gave you that opportunity. And that yes. is such a good point in itself that 
when we have an injury or we have something like a burnout or something that takes us away from our sport, it does give us the space to do other things, to find other parts of us, to utilize those things that our running brains are too tired to access. So yeah. And I you want to know what's so so crazy about that is like, I think about, so Nicholas Sparks, who of course wrote The Notebook and a bazillion books that have been turning to movies and he's a billionaire, maybe, I think. Uh, okay. Anyway, he was a college track athlete. He was an 800 runner and he was injured and bored and wrote a book. He wrote The Notebook. Wow. Um, so that I think that that situation that you talked about of like, yeah, okay, you're losing some part because of injury or burnout or whatever, you're losing this passion. But their life has so life is a smorgasbord people yes. like pick and choose. It's a buffet and there's going to be something else for you. There's something else for you. You know, I love that so much. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is just such an important um, thing to remember and keep in mind and, and yeah, to trust your journey. Right. So Sarah, yeah. that was so good. Anyone else listening? We would love to hear your answers. Um, be sure to get those to us. Thank you, Sarah. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>